This is just like my life. I'm just trying to like make, like make it work and figure things out. In the mid-2010s, the New York social scene was taken by storm by the arrival of Anna Delvey, a German heiress whose father made his money constructing solar panels, or from the oil business, or antiques. No one was really sure where Anna got her fortune, leaving many of her acquaintances to guess. Some thought she was the daughter of a Russian diplomat, while others thought she was German royalty. She gained even more attention from her Instagram account, which had over 40,000 followers, showing her arrival on the New York scene in her glamorous lifestyle. When people met Delby, she told them that she was an heiress set up to inherit close to $60 million on her 25th birthday. Anna would often mention the Anna Delvey Foundation, a members-only art club she wanted to open and how she couldn't wait until she turned 25 and received her trust fund. Anna wormed her way into attending events hosted by New York's wealthy and often hosted her own private dinners in order to make social and business connections. Her crowd seemed to be mostly the younger elites of New York City, who Anna wooed with her fashion sense and air of class and exclusivity. She was always seen wearing designer labels like Acne, Balenciaga, Celine and Supreme, and made sure people knew that designer labels were nothing out of the ordinary for her. People who met Anna often noted that she was rude and would make comments that were classist, not racist. She acted as if she had grown up in the lap of luxury and did not know how to interact with normal people. She wasn't friendly and had an air of superiority about her. She often called people peasants and would ask people to their faces whether they were broke. Broke people should never laugh! Anna set her sights on the historic Church Missions House on Park Avenue South. She used her friendship with Gabriel Calatrava, the son of a famous architect, to try and secure a lease on the over 30,000 square foot building. Anna's goal was for the Anna Delvey Foundation to be a high class hub for social connections and arts appreciation. She promised well known artists like Jeff Koons would exhibit there amongst other grandiose plans. While people thought it was all a bit much and had no idea where Anna would get the money to afford this, it, and I quote, made sense in a New York kind of way. Anna told Richie Notar, one of the founders of Nobu, that her family was big in Germany and they would be in part financially backing this project for her. She had met with Notar to discuss adding a restaurant and bakery inside of the Anna Delvey Foundation. Notar was interested because he wanted someone to bring high culture back to New York City. He was impressed by Delvey's drive, following, and relationships with the upper crust of New York she acquired at such a young age. Remember, Anna was only 23 at the time, and it made Notar feel as if she was legit and he could trust her to revive the city. To secure the church missions house, Delby needed to raise over $20 million. Anna initially sought out help from private investors to raise the $25 million in capital needed to start the Anna Delby Foundation, but eventually decided against it because she did not want to be told what to do by these investors. She photoshopped documents to get a Swiss loan claiming she was worth $60 million and had assets overseas that could prove she would make good on repaying a $22 million loan. She was able to sign a deal with a well-known New York City law firm after signing a document stating that she both had assets to pay for the project and would not do anything to ruin the reputation of the firm. Anna also led the firm to believe that while she had the money to get the foundation off the ground, her assets were tied up overseas and this could be verified by a Swiss bank. Anna also tried to seek donations from her famous friends, who were usually less friends and more people that she had invited to dinner once or twice. DJ LD, who met Anna in 2014, recalled a party Anna invited her and her boyfriend to. When they showed up, it was silent and awkward, and Anna and most of the guests were on their phones. It was evident to Elle that Anna didn't know any of her guests very well, and her guests barely knew each other. She also said that Anna was unfriendly and recalled another night on one of their first meetings where she caught Anna sleeping in her car after not having anywhere else to stay for the night. Dee thought that if Anna was truly the wealthy heiress she claimed to be, she would have had no problem booking a room for the night. A couple months later, Delby called Dee and claimed her credit card wasn't working when she tried to check out of her hotel room. She asked that Dee put the 35,000 euro bill on her card and Delby would pay her back when they got back to New York City. DJ LD respectfully declined. In 2015, Delby met Michael Zhufu Huang, a wealthy arts collector and founder of Beijing's M. Woods Museum. Like Anna, he was well-connected and had amassed his fortune at a young age. Huang noticed quickly that Anna only ever paid for her items with cash. On a trip to Venice, Anna asked him to book their flights and hotel on his card and said that she would pay him back later, which she never did. Michael assumed Delby wasn't paying him back, not because she didn't have the funds to, but because she simply forgot. It was common of Anna to ask people to put expenses on their credit cards, even things as simple as taxi rides, and then she would offer to pay them back in cash, if she paid them back at all. 
In between her stints at lavish hotels, Anna couch surfed and lived in her friend's apartments and didn't pay them back for her stay even after agreeing to do so. People often assumed she was a busy and wealthy heiress who simply didn't have time to pay people back or forgot to due to other obligations. It was only after several failed attempts to get their money back that people would begin to question Delby's legitimacy. In January of 2017, Michael was invited to Anna's 26th birthday party held at a restaurant called Sedell's in Soho. Despite having turned 25 the previous year, Anna still hadn't received her $60 million inheritance. She invited a lot of other wealthy, young, successful people to celebrate with her and hired a PR firm to promote and organize the party. After pictures of Huang and Delby were posted to Instagram, the PR firm contacted Huang and asked for Delby's contact information because she'd never paid her bill. After realizing Delby still owed him money for the Venice trip, Huang came to the conclusion that Delby was lying about who she was and about her wealth. The PR company later received the money from an unknown Venmo account. In February of that same year, Anna checked into New York City's 11 Howard Hotel, which cost over $400 a night. It was unusual for people other than celebrities or heiresses to stay for an extended amount of time. Since the hotel was relatively new and Delby had a glowing reputation in New York, Eleven Howard never asked Delby to provide credit card information to acquire her room. Delby eventually came close friends with concierge Nefertari Davis, who was around her age and looking to break into filmmaking. Anna would come to Davis's desk and ask about places to eat and places to go, and would pay her $100 in cash each time. Their relationship turned into somewhat of a friendship when Davis realized Delby wanted a listening ear, not necessarily advice on where to eat or hang out. During her stay at Eleven Howard, Delby earned the reputation of being a generous tipper, giving hotel staff and others a $100 bill every time they helped her with even the simplest of tasks. The longer she stayed in New York, the larger Anna's circle grew. She had famous friends like Billy McFarland, another scammer, and Macaulay Culkin. She continued to host dinners and make connections to gain funding and support for the Anna Delby Foundation. She likened it to the Soho house when people asked her for details. Delby said she also planned for locations in LA, London, and Hong Kong. She eventually took Nefetari on as a secretary. Nefetari, also called Nef, was treated to luxurious dinners, manicures, and shopping sprees all on Anna's dime. She was always awed by how much money Anna had and how she would spend it like she had an unlimited amount. Delby even tried to convince Neff to break up with her boyfriend by offering to finance Neff's first film, something her boyfriend had promised to do first. Anna also hired a personal trainer and life coach that would encourage her to project confidence and help her succeed in her business deals. She became part of Delby's dwindling friend group, though she took on a more motherly role to Anna and tried to support her in her endeavors to get the Anna Delby Foundation off the ground. By April of 2017, Anna's friend group had become noticeably smaller. Her trainer noticed that Anna seemed lonelier than ever before. Things with her social club seemed to be rocky and Anna began to spend less time partying and more time arguing with lawyers and investors over whether it was possible for the Anna Delby Foundation to come to fruition. It seemed Anna's house of cards was about to fall. One night, when Anna and Neff were out for dinner, Anna provided the waitstaff with a list of 12 credit card numbers, all of which were declined. This stuck Neff with a nearly $300 bill that she couldn't really afford, but paid for anyway thinking it was her turn to return the favor of all the free gifts and dinners Anna had given her. Soon after, Neff was informed by her manager that Eleven Howard still did not have a credit card on file for Delby. The hotel had agreed to accept a wire transfer for the initial funds with the promise that she would soon provide credit card information for future funds. Delby never transferred the money and had run up a bill of almost $30,000 between her hotel stay and frequent meals from Le Cuckoo, the hotel's high-end restaurant. Anna told the hotel the money would come soon, but she was informed that if it did not, she would be locked out of her room. Somehow, mysteriously, Eleven Howard did receive a wire transfer for the money on Delby's behalf likely due to her depositing fraudulent checks. Still, Delby failed to provide credit card information to the hotel to cover future charges. She was locked out of her room while she was out of town for a meeting she claimed would also be attended by Warren Buffett. In May of 2018, Delby planned a trip to Morocco with Neff, her trainer, and Rachel Williams, a photo editor for Vanity Fair she had met through mutual friends. They were going to stay at the luxurious Hotel La Mamunia, and the trip would cost $7,000 a night. When her friends expressed reservations over not being able to afford the trip, Delvey assured them that she would pay for everything. Rightfully so, Neff was convinced by her mother to sit the trip out. 
Zelvi booked the flights for herself, Rachel, and her trainer, but asked Rachel to use her own credit card, and Zelvi promised she would reimburse her. Thinking nothing of it, Rachel agreed. While in Morocco, Anna ran up a $1,300 charge while shopping. When her card declined, she claimed it was because she forgot to tell her bank she was traveling abroad. She asked Rachel to put the bill on her credit card, to which Rachel agreed. Days into the trip, the hotel managers cornered Anna and Rachel and said that if they could not provide a working credit card to pay for the trip, they would be arrested. This was news to Rachel, as she assumed Delby had things under control. Anna then called the trainer for help, who had left the trip early due to food poisoning. The trainer booked Delby a first-class trip back to New York City, and upon her return, Anna moved her belongings from 11 Howard to the Beekman Hotel. Rachel Williams ended up footing the $62,000 bill on her Annex card. The cost of the trip was more than her yearly salary at Vanity Fair. Anna never made good on her promises to pay Rachel back. It was such a, a complex, paralyzing moment for me. She owed me more money than I made in a year. I'm late with my rent. I'm late with my credit card payments. I'm like in a lot of trouble. Back in New York City, Delby was kicked out of the Beekman Hotel for failing to pay a nearly $12,000 bill. After running the same scam on the W Hotel, Anna was caught again, kicked out, and basically left homeless. Both the Beekman and the W pressed charges against Anna. Anna promised everyone once she signed the lease for the church mission's house, she would have enough money to pay everyone back. However, Anna was later told that the building had been rented already and her plans for the Anna Delvey Foundation imploded, leaving her no way to return the thousands of dollars she had grifted from people. Anna's crimes included falsifying the statement to secure the Swiss loan and depositing bad checks and withdrawing as much cash as possible before she was caught. Selvi would beg banks for credit line extensions by promising the bank she would pay the money back quickly and she would use these extensions to withdraw money for wire transfers she would use to pay off other debts. Anna also attempted to pay people off or prove she had the funds to pay them by giving them fake wire transfer receipts. By now, it was evident that Anna Delvey was not a German heiress and she certainly wasn't wealthy. So who was this young European woman who turned New York City upside down? Anna Delvey's real name is Anna Sorokin. She was born in Russia and moved to Germany as a teenager. Her father was a truck driver who eventually worked in HVAC. Her mother owned a convenience store. The Sorokin family was comfortably middle class, but Anna wanted more from life. She eventually left Germany to attend college in London, returning before she graduated to work for a fashion company in Berlin. Her parents supported her living expenses during this time, as Anna convinced them that this would be a great investment into her future. It was when she went to Paris to intern for a French magazine named Purple that Anna Sorokin began to call herself Anna Delvey and the rest was history. Anna was arrested in October of 2017 after being set up by Rachel Williams with the help of the police. She was arrested on counts of attempted grand larceny and theft of services. She scammed people out of nearly $275,000. Anna refused to accept a plea deal and pled not guilty. She was held without bail on Rikers Island. Sorokin said that if people really wanted to see whether she had any money, she should have been given the chance to post bail. For the trial, Sorokin's attorney hired her a personal stylist for court appearances, saying it was important that she looked perfect for court. Her defense tried to paint Anna as a European immigrant who achieved the American dream by making rich friends and creating a life for herself most could only dream of, even if it was only temporary. He conveniently skirted around her scamming people to get the money. Anna often would not want to enter the courtroom or would ask to push her trial dates back if she didn't like her outfit. Anna was sent to prison in April of 2019 on a 4-12 to year sentence. She was found guilty of second-degree larceny, theft of services, and first-degree attempted grand larceny. She was found not guilty of the charges from her actions against Rachel Williams and therefore was not legally responsible for returning the $62,000 Rachel had paid for their trip to Morocco. Anna insists that there was nothing fake about her plans for the Anna Delvey Foundation and that had she gotten the money, she would have followed through on her plans for the club. She was interested in truly creating a name for herself in the New York and never wanted to be known as a socialite, but instead as someone who used their money to contribute to society. Sorokin admitted her obsession was likely with power, not with money or social connections. Anna said she doesn't regret any of her experiences, including going to prison. She said it shaped who she was as a person and realized it could bring her opportunities in the future.
The question that remains is why it was so easy for Anna Sorokin to scan some of the wealthiest and most well-connected people in New York City. There are people who would wonder how you were able to go into these places and, and, and for people to assume that you had the money. Do you think it was because you were a young white woman? Definitely. Anna wasn't known for being especially charming or attractive, but she acted sure of herself and she played the part of an heiress so well many never questioned her. Anna gave off the outward appearance of wealth, so much so that when her actions or words didn't match the picture she had painted for herself, people ignored it. Because people assumed Sorokin had money, they never made her verify this until it was too late. Sorokin said if people assumed that just because she was pulling out $100 bills that she had a lot of money, that that was their problem. I guess it was also their fault for believing she had money when she constantly mentioned having a $60 million inheritance. Society makes assumptions about people based on their appearances, whether they're nice, honest, good, bad, or criminals, and this almost never tells the full story of someone's character or intentions. Since Sorokin looked like she could afford to pay for things, and just like she simply didn't want to at the moment, Anna convinced people to extend her blind trust based on little more than her outward appearance and persona. People commented on her alluring European accent that couldn't quite be placed, which added to this elegant persona of wealth and class that they wrongfully associated with Anna. Anna used common tactics influencers also use in order to reinvent herself. Like Sorokin, influencers make people believe that they have lavish lives through many of the same methods. Renting vehicles, faking photos of first class flights, and taking out loans or borrowing money from people that they may or may not pay back in order to craft the illusion that they're living the luxe life. Influencers thrive off of acting as if they have more money than they do by showing off an abundance of material goods and lavish trips and dinners. Influencers often fail to show off their financial reality or discuss the things they have to do in order to achieve the lifestyle that they pretend to have. Social media allows you to reinvent yourself and this persona eventually must carry into real life once the person gains enough popularity. When they met her, Anna could give people the illusion of exclusivity, something we all desire. We desire to be seen as separate from others and as if we have access to people and places others can only dream of. We desire to inspire envy in those on the outside looking in at our lives, especially in cities as cutthroat and appearance-based as New York City. People want to be seen as having cool people in their circle and often do little vetting beyond how the person looks and dresses. The trick to getting into any exclusive setting is simply acting like you belong, which people often don't question if you can play the part well enough. Anna used this to her advantage and reinvented herself so much that Anna Sorokin no longer existed. She was Anna Delby. Anna was released from jail in February 2021. She's now in the Scammer Hall of Fame along with the likes of Billy McFarland and Elizabeth Holmes. She's achieved a cult-like following of those who say she did nothing wrong and the wealthy people she scammed got what they deserved for falling into her trap without doing their due diligence. Anna is currently in custody of ICE awaiting her deportation back to Germany which she says would be worse than returning to prison. In 2021, an episode on Sorokin was featured in HBO's Generation Hustle, a docuseries based around scams cooked up in the past decade. Sorokin sold her life rights for $320,000, a measly amount compared to the lifestyle Anna Delvey was living before, to Netflix to create a scripted series on her life headed by Shonda Rhimes. Sorokin maintains that she did nothing wrong. She's had a pretty unapologetic attitude in regards to the situation and admitted she regrets nothing. After all, if people were willing to part with their money in order to give it to a stranger, that wasn't really her fault. She said meeting the wealthy people she did showed her that people with money aren't as smart as society gives them credit for being, and they're often more obsessed with appearances than substance. She says her plans for the NNW Foundation were legit, and had the foundation existed, everyone would have been paid back. The truly wealthy cheat people out of money on a regular basis, very few of whom have had actual plans to use their money to add anything to their community. Sorokin said she hopes to eventually rewrite the narrative that she is some dumb, greedy person, as, in her opinion, it is far from the truth. So are you sort of milking your crime for the fame? No, definitely not. Do you feel badly? Do you have regrets? I feel like I'm just trying to deal with, um, with consequences of my actions. Um, I was young, I would not repeat my actions. I'm just trying to make the best out of my situation.